Good morning and welcome to this Sunday's worship, Trinity Sunday, the 7th of June, at St Nicholas Methodist Church. Let us worship the Lord. The blessing of Father, Spirit, Son, Holy Trinity, three in one, be in our meeting, in our greeting, in the worship we share and the words of our prayer. Blessing of Father, Spirit, Son, Holy Trinity, three in one, be in our living and our breathing, that through our hearts and our words your truth may be heard. Majestic Creator God, God before time, we find you in the heavens above us, light beyond light, our beginnings before all beginnings. God with us, we find you here on earth all around us. You make your home in our fellowship and communion, our daily bread and in your church, the body of Christ. Spirit of Pentecost, fire, Holy Ghost, we find you burning in truth, ministering with comfort and interceding with us with sighs too deep for words. God, stretch our imaginations. Open our eyes to see you in your majesty above us, your mystery around us and your spirit within us. Amen. A prayer of confession. Let us before the God of tenderness and love offer the prayers of who we are and name those times when we have not responded to God's love.
Jesus Christ, the face of God to us. In you we see God's love reflected. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus Christ, peace from God to us, you bring reconciliation to the whole world. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, our life and unity through the Spirit poured out on us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, in your compassion and lead us to joys of everlasting life. Amen. God has promised that whenever we repent and seek a new union with God, forgiveness is ours. That promise comes true now. Sisters and brothers, know that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. When I was a kid, my grandma would correct me if she heard me using bad grammar. For instance, if I told her something like, my friend draws good, she would say, no, Dale, he doesn't draw good, he draws well. Grammar lays out the basic rules of a language to ensure we're speaking correctly, and if you grew up with a grammar like mine, you'll know that good grammar is essential to effective communication. So, Christians believe that God is Trinitarian. The word Trinity means three in one, and to say that God is a Trinity means he is one single undivided God, and yet at the very same time, three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This can cause a lot of confusion among non-Christians, who know as well as we do that one plus one plus one equals three, so either the Christians worship three different gods, or they just can't do simple math. Even many Christians find the idea of the Trinity difficult to explain, so they don't tend to emphasize it a lot. This confusion comes, in part, because often we think about the Trinity as though it were sort of a schematic that describes what God's inner workings look like. And because God is God and we're not, any attempt to sketch out a schematic for God is bound to fail. So perhaps a better way to think about the Trinity is as a grammar for God talk. Just like English grammar lays out the guidelines for using the English language correctly, the Trinity lays out the guidelines for speaking correctly about God. You see, the very first Christians were all first century Jews, and they took the teaching of the Torah very seriously when it says that the Lord your God is one God, and you shall love him with all your heart. There's only one God. That's the most basic rule of God grammar. But at the same time, they had encountered the man, Jesus Christ, a first century Jew who taught them to pray to God as if they were talking to a loving father. And then they saw him crucified and rise again the third day. And here's the thing, their encounter with the living Jesus was so profound that they began to worship him as God. So Jesus is God. That's another rule of God grammar. But then if someone were to ask them, are you saying that Jesus is the same as God the Father? They would have had to say, no, Jesus is fully God, otherwise we can't worship him. But at the same time, he spoke to God as his heavenly Father and taught us to do the same. So Jesus is not God the Father. To say that would be bad grammar. Of course, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit came and filled those first Christians up to overflowing with his love. And the experience they had of the Holy Spirit was just like the experience they had of Jesus. So they started talking about the Holy Spirit in the same way as they did Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God. Good God grammar. But the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us and reminds us of his teaching. So he's not the Son or the Father. To say that would be bad grammar. The Trinity then lays out the guidelines for speaking correctly about God. There's only one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. The Son is not the Father and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. All those statements are good grammar. 
But if we say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all just different appearances of the same single God, or if we talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as though they were three different gods or one was not God, in each of those cases, we're using bad grammar. But if we say something like, the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, in that case, we're speaking good about God. The first lesson is from Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. The Great Commission Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. The second lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. Final greetings. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. These words are familiar to most churchgoers and often they come at the end of the service, don't they? Words are so familiar. They run off the tongue so easily, yet I'm afraid we do not pause to take what tremendous significance these words make. I'm afraid that we sometimes slip into thinking them as the sort of signal that the, the service is ended, it's time we get our coats and go home for lunch. But what if we paused and realised the depth of meaning in these words? They would make all the difference to our worship of God in church and in our community. But more than that, all the difference to the rest of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. The danger of familiarity becomes a sort of trapped norm we hold in contempt but can't shake off. Two construction workers had taken a lunch break and opened their, their lunch box. One looked inside the box and said, no, not cheese and pickle again. I can't believe it. I hate cheese and pickle. This is the third time this week that I've had cheese and pickle. The other said, why don't you get your wife to make you something different? I'm not married, he said. I don't have a wife. I made these myself. Our contempt is often in our own hands, although we try to blame everyone else. The grace of Christ. Think how awesome these words are. The grace of Christ. They infer the personal impact of Jesus Christ upon us and his will to make us quite different from what we were before. It means that this morning, though apart, we are held together because of the universal nearness of Jesus with us. Just as he was near to those he saw, who saw him in the towns and villages of Galilee, as present with us as he was at the lakeside or in the streets of Jerusalem, that is what his grace means. You know, perhaps the old child's definition of grace says it all in a nutshell. Grace is the power Christ gives me to make me like himself. What were the effects that Christ had upon those who encountered him? There were some who felt guilty on account of their sins, and he brought them the assurance of forgiveness that lifted a load of their hearts. And he said, go in peace, sin no more. And if that's you, if you are burdened with the feeling of guilt, be very assured of the absolution of Christ, so beautifully summed up in the words, if you confess your sins and ask his forgiveness, he will forgive those sins. And that can be real and overwhelming. But remember the words of Dante who said, in his will is our peace. In a version of the Collect for today, it says, Grant that grace may prevent and follow us. Remember that grace means the personal presence of the Lord Jesus, and that can have a great impact upon us. When Billy Graham was driving through a small southern town, he was stopped by a policeman and charged with speeding. Graham admitted his guilt, but was told by the officer that he would have to appear in court. The judge asked, guilty or not guilty? And when Graham pleaded guilty, the judge replied, that'll be ten dollars, a dollar for every mile you went over the limit. Suddenly, the judge recognised the famous minister. You have violated the law, he said. The fine must be paid, but I'm going to pay it for you. He took a ten dollar bill from his wallet and attached it to the ticket and then took Graham out and brought him a steak dinner. That, said Billy Graham, is how God treats the repentant sinner. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. We only have the grace of Jesus because of the giving love of God the Father. We talk in facile way about love of God for the world. 
But when we say that God loves the world, we mean that the Holy Trinity of God's love falls on every single man, woman and child in the world. We who are made in his own divine image. On the West Front, on the Cathedral of Chartres in France, there is one of the most beautiful sculptures in the world. It's called The Creation of Adam. And in it, the hands of God are depicted resting on Adam's head. The image suggests God moulding the first human into existence. And in the sculpture, we can see the hands of wonderful strength, of care, of tenderness, almost exquisitely executed in the sculptor's craft. That's it. The love of God means that the strength and the care and the tenderness of the Creator rest upon every single one of us. God cares for you all that much. His compassionate care rests upon each one of us. And that's what the love of God means. And when we take to heart the gift described in the words of the grace, we see the God-given difference. You will find yourself humble to the point of unfettered adoration. You will find yourself full of gratitude. You will find that the whole scale of priorities and concerns in your life may be turned upside down. Why? Because the love of God and your response to it has to become the number one principle of living. A certain medieval monk announced that he would be preaching next Sunday evening on the love of God. As the shadows fell and the light ceased to come through the cathedral windows, the congregation gathered in the darkness at the altar. The monk lit a candle and carried it to the crucifix. First of all, he illuminated the crown of thorns. Next, the two wounded hands. Then the marks of the spear wound. In the hush that fell, he blew out the candle and left the chancel. There was nothing else to say. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit do you realise naturally and inevitably there is a renewing fellowship that flows from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God? If God so utterly loves us, he will want to give to each of us the greatest gift he could possibly give, and that give is, gift is nothing less than himself. The gift of the Holy Spirit. It means literally God in you. God on the soil of Palestine, the Lord Jesus. God, the infinite creator, the Father. God in you, the Holy Spirit. Perpetual givenness of Pentecost, even here today. This wonderful gift of fellowship is the gift that unites the multifarious oneness of God's divine creation and unites them one to another. The Holy Spirit is the gift which we can do no other than share. The Holy Spirit is the gift who melds difference into the wonderful multicoloured whole. The Holy Spirit is not an exclusive gift, but an all-embracing perfect planter of the seas that will bear the fruit of love and joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Why don't we know the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and definitely the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Dr. Fisher once wrote to his friend Lord Eldon, asking him for a special favour. Lord Eldon answered, Dear Fisher, I cannot today give you preferment for which you ask. I remain your sincere friend, Eldon. Turn over. He turned it over and found on the other side, I gave it to you yesterday. Our Heavenly Father similarly answers his children when they ask him for the indwelling or baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? How wonderful, you might say, 
But to complete the verse from Corinthians, it goes on to say, you are not your own. Is that a sting in the tail? When we say the grace, we are confirming in each other that we belong to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We who worship online today are wonderfully pledged to that great reality. The reality of the triune name of God. The infinite love of our Creator. The redeeming love of our Saviour Christ. The affirming presence of the Holy Spirit. What is our response to the word? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Prayer of Thanksgiving Holy God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer and Comforter, here in this place and at this time we offer our thanks. The words of our mouths, the thoughts of our minds, the feelings of our hearts, in all we thank you for all that you have given to us and all that you have accomplished through us. And even despite us, we thank you. Amen. For the blessing and gathering in community, we thank you. Hear our prayers for those still on the outside and living in isolation.
For the blessing of imagination and inspiration, we thank you. Hear our prayers for those whose minds are closed down and those whose lives are listless. For the blessing of joy and good health, we thank you. Hear our prayers for those living with sadness and struggling with pain and frailty. We spend a moment in silence, bring to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit those whose needs weigh heavy on our hearts. Threefold God, we pray that you will continue to bless our world, our nation and our church, distinct yet united, diverse yet interwoven. Call your people, all your people, into the communion of your love, where each is named and known. And this we pray, in the love of the Father, the healing of the Son, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the holy wisdom of God guide your ways and guide your paths. May the living truth of God enlighten your hearts and open your minds. And may the living spirit of God give you life and life to the full. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit 
be with you. Amen.